So Leviticus, the 16th chapter, I'm going to do some jumping around, so follow me. I'm going to start in the 7th verse. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat until into the wilderness. Now let's skip over to verse 15. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, Bring its blood inside the veil. Do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions. For all their sins and so shall he do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Now let's jump down. To verse 21. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sin, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. And the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. This passage of scripture that we just read tells the story of our redemption. It's the story of a daring escape from an immortal danger. It tells the story of Jesus Christ. So today I want to talk to you from the subject, Jesus, our scapegoat. Now we hear the word scapegoat today, and, and many times it's used slightly incorrectly, but it is in use. I want to read you the definition of the word scapegoat. One that is made to bear the blame of others. Someone who is assigned the blame or made to take the fall for something. That sounds like Jesus. And today when the word scapegoat is used, it's often used if you have a group of people and they all did dirt and one of them get caught, then he claims, they making me the scapegoat. But this is different because the one who was made the scapegoat didn't do dirt. He was assigned blame for what other people did. Now check the Merriam-Webster definition of scapegoat. A goat upon whose head is symbolically placed the sins of the people after which he is sent into the wilderness in the biblical ceremony for Yom Kippur. So the Merriam-Webster dictionary acknowledges that this word exists because of the Bible. The origin of the word scapegoat came from this book right here. And so we want to look at Jesus as our scapegoat. And one of the things that is so, so um, I don't know, so confidence building about this verse and the fact that it tells the story of Jesus is that this was written at, at between three and 4,000 years before Jesus ever showed up on the scene to God. So God was telling the story about Jesus long before he ever showed up. And you know, it made me think about it, and this is where the confidence came in. It must be so frustrating for Satan to be two million moves behind God all the time. As they say, Satan is playing checkers and God is playing chess. And so God had this plan, this plan in place. See, see, the Bible talks about the Old Testament being types and shadows. 
So you see my shadow here, but that's not really what's going on. That's just a shadow of it. The shadow is there because I'm here. And so these Old Testament, a lot of the Old Testament was written to point the way, to give us um, a picture of what was to come. So today I want to look at this, this, this process that God commanded them to do and show us how it speaks to Jesus. And the first thing I want to do is, is what way I want to approach this is by answering two questions. See, when, when we read this, for most people or for many people, two questions emerge. The first is, why are there two goats? Why do you need two goats? And the second and more relevant or the more pressing question is, why is one of them left alive? Did you notice one of them was left alive? And, and in, 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 in animal sacrifices, typically the animal is killed. And the blood is, you know, sprinkled on the stuff. But in this case, there are two goats. Why two? One of them is killed. One of them is left alive. Why is one left alive? Because it tells the story of the condition of man and the redemp redemption that Jesus provided us. So let's get into it. The first question we'll look at is why are there two goats? There are two goats because there are two problems. Each goat solves a problem. The first goat solves the first problem. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 59. Now listen, this, this is going to have a little bit of depth to it, so I need y'all to uh, pay attention. Amen? I need y'all to shake off the laziness. Nudge your neighbor and tell them, pay attention. Isaiah 59 gives us the first problem. We want to look at one verse, and let's read that together. Isaiah 59, we want to look at the second verse. And Isaiah 59, chapter 2, let's read that together. Ready? Read. But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. So the first problem is there is a separation between God and man as a result of sin that separates us and makes it such that we cannot commune with God while we're alive. See, this is talking about why we're alive because it's saying he won't hear. So this is when we're alive and we're trying to pray and, and our, uh, the sin has separated us and it's saying not that God cannot hear, he will not hear. Because that sin has created a separation. The second problem we see revealed in Luke chapter 16, and we've looked at this before, but we're going to look at it again because it's critical, number one, and it's often forgotten, number two. But if we understand this, 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 um, this story that Jesus told, this, this historical account that he gave, it will revolutionize our walk with God. So in Luke, the 16th chapter, I'm going to do some jumping around, so follow me. And the scene is, Jesus is telling them about these two guys, a rich man and Lazarus. You all, Lazarus, you all are familiar with that. Verse 19, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who laid at his gate desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dog came, dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. I want to stop right here to make a delineation. From this point on, we are talking about two dead people. The rich man died. Lazarus died. So everything that we read beyond this are talking about two people that are dead and buried. Amen. Let's keep reading. And being in torment in Hades, talking about the rich man, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. 
Now he is comforted and you are tormented. Besides all of this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, neither can those from there pass to us. And now, full of hopelessness and understanding that I'm in here and I can't get out, he says, I beg you, therefore, that you would send him to my father's house. I got five brothers that he may testify to them so that they don't come to this place of torment. Abraham said to me, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. And he said, but hold on, Abraham. If one of them goes, if somebody goes to them from the dead, they'll listen. Jesus in his wisdom, or Abraham in his wisdom said, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. See, that's how nobody, people aren't persuaded, even though Jesus rose from the dead. So I want to pull two things out of this. One of them we, we talk about often, but I want to reiterate it because we need to keep it front and center. And the first thing is to point out, and this, all, this has to do with the second problem, that from verse, from verse 23 on, we're talking about two people that are dead and buried, but they're still alive. Y'all see that? They're dead and buried, but alive. And so their body has been buried, but the real them, the man on the inside, is still alive. And not only is the man on the inside still alive, but it gives us a description. So for example, the man on the inside, we all got a man or a woman on the inside has eyes because it said he lifted up his eyes. He has a mouth because he's talking. He has ears because he's hearing. He's got a tongue because he said send Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. Lazarus has got a finger. The point is, only inside of us is a person. We are a spirit being that has a body. It's just not a physical body. And so the inward man is not smoke or vapor or some formless thing. The inward person is a person. Yeah. And we need to keep that front and center. Yeah. So that's the first thing we learn. The second thing that we learn is that in the Old Testament, when people died, their spirits didn't go to heaven. That's the second problem. There's a separation that exists while man was alive on earth, and there was a separation that existed when men died and their spirits left their bodies. Two goats, two problems. The first goat solved the first problem. The second goat solved the second problem. Y'all following me? So now, let's look at why one goat is left alive. So turn with me to, uh, let's, go to um, let's go to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 shows us both goats, and, and each goat represents Jesus. One goat represents Jesus' physical body. The second goat represents the real Jesus, the man on the inside. You know, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The second goat represents the Jesus that existed from eternity past and was put into a body. So now, Isaiah 53. This is the, the verse concerning the Messiah. Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs, or that it really should be translated sicknesses, and we know that by looking at the Hebrew word and also looking at Matthew 8. Surely he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Yet they esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So this is the first goat. It is the goat that is killed and that solves the problem of the separation between God and man while we're alive on the earth. Jesus, all of these things that we read about Jesus, were, they happened to him physically. 
He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. We read, we talked about on Friday how he was beaten and, and been smacked and spit on and all that. That's all, that all happened in his physical body. His stripes, we were healed. That's the first goal. Now let's jump over to chapter, uh, verse 10, same chapter, 10th verse. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. That word bruise is a, literally means to crush. He has put him to grief. Now get, get the next sentence. When you make his soul an offering for sin. So we're no longer talking about the body. You see that? We're talking about the real Jesus, the inward man, the one that existed before he got put in the body. God made his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Get verse 11. He shall see the labor. That word labor is literally travail. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. So this is talking about the, the spirit Jesus. So the first goat deals with the physical problem. The second goat deals with the spiritual problem. Y'all follow me? Now, the reason the second goat is kept alive is because the spirit never dies. See, the body dies. First goat dies. The second goat is kept alive because when our, we die physically, our spirit does not cease to exist. Our spirit continues to live. Y'all following me? So the second goat continues to live. Then if you recall what, what the Bible says about the goat, the, the, the Bible says Aaron, representing all of Israel, will lay his hands on that second goat, confessing over it all of the sins, the transgressions, the iniquities of the people, and then not kill it, send it away. What happened when Jesus was on that cross? What did he say? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was sent away. And so the second goat was kept alive because spiritually we don't die in terms of ceasing to exist. Dying is separation from God. And so that goat is separated from the, 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 the tabernacle, the temple of God, from the people of God, and made to wander in the wilderness. Just like when Jesus took our sin and, and he was separated from God, and then when he was separated from God, he went and paid the penalty for our sin. So two goats, two problems. One dies because we die physically. The other lives because spiritually we continue to live. Now, this whole, turn to, uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Glory to God. The wisdom of God. Hebrews tells the entire story. Hebrews is my favorite book for that reason. I'm going to start in verse 1. I'm going to read some chunks, so follow me. Verse 1 of Hebrews 9. Then indeed, the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and an earthly sanctuary. Y'all see that, an earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared. In the first part was the lampstand and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And behind the second veil the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which has the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tablets of the covenant, and above it was the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. So this is when they killed the first goat and it said that they would take the blood of the goat and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Let's keep going. Verse 6. 
Now, when these things had thus been prepared, the priests, plural, always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the, service, the services, but into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sin committed in ignorance. Now, the next verse tells us what the point of all of this Old Testament sacrifice and temple, all of it meant. The Holy Spirit indicating that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. In Hebrews, when you see the word conscience, substitute the word spirit. So those gifts and sacrifices which are offered cannot make the spirit perfect. It's only concerned with foods and drinks and various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed into the time of Reformation. So the whole setup is meant to, to reveal that there's a separation between God and man. The reason that all those veils exist is because it signifies that there's a separation between God and man. That's what the whole setup meant. It was to illustrate the problem of mankind. Now, let's keep reading. But Christ came as a high priest of good things to come. Now pay attention as we read this. Of good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say not of this creation. So now we're talking about a different tabernacle. And the Bible says that it's not made with hands, it's not of the earth. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. See, it was all about the flesh in the Old Testament. It, the sin was covered. It wasn't removed. How much more, say how much more, shall the blood of Christ which through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your spirit from dead works to serve the living God. Let's keep reading. Verse 19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats and water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled the book and the people and, and all of this stuff. Then it says, likewise, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Now get verse 23. Stay with me because I'm going to walk through it step by step. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies, so all that Old Testament tabernacle and process was a copy. So it was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, glory to God, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. That's the whole story of the bulls and the goats. So let's walk through this. The first thing that happened with Jesus' sacrifice was that he died physically, goat number one. The second thing was that he became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, I believe it is, he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So he became sin for us. Then he died spiritually, meaning he was separated from God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Third, he then goes to hell and pays the penalty for our sin. You will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. Then 
After that, turn with me to Acts chapter 13. He goes to hell, pays the penalty for our sin, the punishment, takes our punishment, and then remember in Isaiah 53, it said, when you see this, you shall see the travail of his soul. You shall see the suffering of his spirit and be satisfied. In other words, that satisfies the requirement for sin. I see what Jesus did and the debt has been paid. So now that the debt has been paid, let's see what happens. Acts chapter 13, verse 33. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus as it is written in the second psalm. So the second psalm, he said, is talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Now what does the second psalm say? You are my son, today I have begotten you. So what this tells us is that once God saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied, he then resurrected Jesus spiritually, raised him from the dead without sin. Jesus was born again. This day I have begotten you. See, one of the things about Jesus is, and we talked about Friday how he was committed. He walked every step that we walk. He didn't sit up in heaven apart and come up with some plan. He walked every step. We get born again because he did first. That's why the Bible says that he was the firstborn among many brethren. Because he led the way. So God resurrected him spiritually. Glory to God. Then, he stopped by the tomb and picked up his body. See, if he wasn't resurrected spiritually, he never could have been resurrected physically. So he goes, picks up his body, and the next thing that happens is what we see here in the book of Hebrews. So it says, I'm going to read it just so I'm exact with it. After he's raised up, born again, Apart from sin, it says this. Remember, remember, this is what happens. This is when it says, um, Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven be purified with goats and bulls and stuff, but the heavenly things themselves with a better sacrifice. For Christ has not entered the holy place, verse 24. He has not entered the holy place made with hands, the copies of the true, but into heaven itself. So now, Jesus goes into the tabernacle in heaven and he presents himself as our sacrifice. See, that's, they did it in the Old Testament. The high priest went in by himself once a year to present all the blood and stuff. But that's just a type and a shadow. Jesus went to heaven in the tabernacle in heaven himself and said, here's the sacrifice, Father. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then the next thing that happened, we praise you, Lord, is that those saints, Old Testament saints that we read about in Luke 16, they get let out. Because now there's no barrier. See, they were in this place uh, called Abraham's bosom because they couldn't go to heaven because there was that veil in the temple. That, that, that sign there's the separation. You can't come here. But now that Jesus presented himself, now they can go to heaven now. Yeah. Glory to God. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. See, that tabernacle in heaven that the tabernacle in Jerusalem is based on was locked up, and man could not come, to, come into it after, the, after man died. So Ephesians... Chapter 4 says this. Verse 8. I'm sorry, Ephesians. Yeah, chapter 4, verse 8. This is talking about Jesus. It said, therefore he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to man. Now he, now this, he ascended, 
What does it mean that first he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the one also who ascended far above all things. So this verse, this word, this phrase in, chapter, in verse 8 that says he led captivity captive. Other translations say he led captives in his train. So after he goes to heaven, and, and if, if you remember, you, you might have read this and, and maybe thought this is kind of odd, but do you remember when Jesus, after he was resurrected and, and he appeared to Mary? Do you all remember he said, don't touch me? Yeah. Y'all remember that? Don't touch me. But why did he say don't touch me? Don't touch me because I have not yet ascended to my father and your father, to my God and, and your God. He had not gone and presented himself yet. So don't touch me because I'm, I'm pure, I'm holy, the sin has been put away, don't touch me. So then he goes up there, presents himself, then he goes back down, leads, he, he, he opens up Abraham's bosom and says, y'all can come on out now because the way has been provided. Turn to uh, Matthew chapter 27. Glory to God. The 27th chapter of Matthew, I'm going to start reading in verse 50. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. He died. Verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. See, the veil that was torn was not the veil in the temple in Jerusalem. It was the veil in the temple in heaven. That was what was torn. Then it says there was an earthquake, the rocks were split. Now, get this. Verse 52. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had died were raised, and coming out of the grave when? After the resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. See, Jesus let them out. Glory to God. He let them out of Abraham's bosom, and God wanted to mark the occasion, so he allowed them to show themselves to people around Jerusalem because Jesus let them out. Glory to God. And then the next thing that happened is turn to Acts chapter 1. to God. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. First chapter of Acts. I'm going to read verse 9. Start in verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. So this is his ascension after he 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 appears to them and all that, then he goes back to heaven. But I want you to notice it said a cloud received him. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. Now the 12th chapter of Hebrews follows the 11th chapter of Hebrews. You're welcome. <laughs> I know you were wondering. The 11th chapter of Hebrews is famously called the Hall of Faith. Why is it called that? Because the 11th chapter of Hebrews goes over all these Old Testament saints who died in the faith. Abraham, Isaac, Moses, Amen, uh, Sarah, Barak, it goes, uh, uh, this, it just lists all of these people who have died, Rahab, Gideon, Samson, all these people who have died before. Now get the first verse of chapter 12. The first thing I want you to pay attention to, it says, therefore. That means I'm still talking about what I was talking about. So I named all of these people who died in the Old Testament and, and, and Samson and Gideon and Moses and Joseph and all of them. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses and a cloud received him out of their sight. So this is when Jesus led the captives in his train 
up to heaven. So he led them up to heaven with him because now the way has been made and you can go live in heaven and have access to the temple of God. You can get behind the second veil. You can fellowship with God face to face, spirit to spirit, person to person because it's finished. Glory to God. That's the story of Easter. Hmm. Glory to God. The first goat took care of what we did. The second goat took care of who we were. What do you mean by who we were? Our nature was corrupted by sin. See, the problem wasn't just what we did, it was who we were. And that's why after they died, they couldn't go to heaven because now who you really are is standing there and is sin, corrupted by sin. And that's why we have to be born again because our nature gets changed. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God. We get a new nature. And so Jesus' sacrifice on the spiritual side changed who we were. Glory to God. So the first goat took care of what we did. The second goat, who we were. And so now we're not the same if we're in Christ. We've been recreated into the likeness and image of God with his nature. Glory to God. Remember when Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil? See, with the wrong nature, you can't approach God. But with a new nature, he who knew no sin was made, sin, made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God. We have his nature again. And now we have free access behind the veil. We can go into heaven. And so now when people die in Christ, you take the express train. <laughs> Glory to God. Right to heaven. Glory to God. Two goats, two problems, one man, two solutions. And we're redeemed. Hallelujah. Oh, if you're redeemed in this place, lift your voice and give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. With a new nature. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He didn't just change what you do. He changed who you were. Taking back the land is promised, we will not forget.